You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to the Film Literature and the New World Order podcast. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And as always, it's the third Monday of the month as we return to our regular schedule after our summer disruption. Thank you for sticking with it. And thank you for trogging uh, your way through the portrait of the artist as a young man. I know it's not a light read, but I'm glad that you were able to do so in preparation for our conversation, because of course you wouldn't be listening to this conversation if you hadn't done the homework, right? Well, now that I've suckered you into that, I have to reveal the fact that, uh, well, we're probably not going to be confining today's exploration to a portrait of the artist as a young man. In fact, we're probably going to be ranging throughout the works of James Joyce, um, but don't worry, I don't think you'll have to have read everything he's ever written in order to appreciate this conversation. Uh, I haven't read everything he's ever written, but probably close to it. Um, but joining us for this conversation is going to be from the Emerald Isle, none other than Thomas Sheridan, and I'm sure that my longtime listeners will remember Thomas Sheridan from our previous conversations. We've had a few conversations now on the subject of psychopathy, uh, uh, circling around his books, uh, for example, Defeated Demons, Freedom from Consciousness, Parasites in Psychopathic Society, or Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. But he is the author of, well, many other works and and, uh, blog posts and other things besides. He's also an artist and uh, the host of The Velocity of Now, a radio show slash podcast that I hope all of you are paying attention to. All of the relevant links will be included in the show notes for this conversation, but his one-stop shop for all of these links is thomassheridanarts.com, so please go there for more information on Thomas and his work. Thomas Sheridan, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm delighted to be asked, James. Thank you. Well, let's get into the story of how I came to ask you to uh, participate in this conversation about James Joyce, and long story short... I was on YouTube, browsing your uh, YouTube channel earlier this year, when I saw an interesting post about James Joyce, the Magus from Monto, and it's basically the uh, the biography channel version of the James Joyce story, but you uh, also had an interesting subheader for that in your on your channel. You said, Portrait of the Artist as a Literary Magician. So I, I watched that uh, uh, biography and thought to myself, you know, I... If any, if I'm if I'm qualified to talk about anything on the planet, it would probably be James Joyce. So, why not have you on to talk about James Joyce and your position when it comes to Joyce as I don't know a muse, uh, an inspiration, uh, an enemy, a rival? I have no idea what your uh, your take on Joyce and his work is, or his uh, place in Irish history or the Irish context. So, I'm going to completely open it up to you. We haven't even really pre-discussed this, so I'd like to know. Why? How? Why did you post that to your channel? Are you interested in Joyce? In what way do you uh, approach Joyce and his works? Well, all and none of the above, which is probably very Joycean. <laughs> uh, well, I grew up on the north side of Dublin, so I grew up in. I was born in. The, I was born in the sixties, and my grandparents and the world that I grew up in, uh, you know, was still like the, the, the Victorian world that Joyce writes about. I mean, a lot of the kind of songs and poems and the the way people speak in in those books was the world that I grew up in. So that was kind of, you know, familiar to me, the kind of use of language, the kind of strange, lyrical, sardonic slash whimsical way that working class and middle class people used to talk there. All sadly all gone now. And so that was that was interesting to me now i'll explain to you about joyce first i hated joyceans when i was growing up when I was, <laughs> because in ireland it was some sort of like oafish uh bombastic you know trinity guy with his his, <laughs> his arms spread apart outside a pub that he you know he probably wouldn't normally go to and he's putting on the different voices of Book Mulligan and the Citizen and all this <laughs> kind of thing. And it, I, I can say it truly annoyed me now because it just was so, it seems so, I don't know, so pretentious or something to me. And I did, I preferred like things like Brendan Bean, if you were going to go into that kind of Irish literature. Well, it's different, but I mean, of the, of the what they consider the classic ones. And so, I don't know, I was probably about 19, 20 before I read anything. 
and it was the the Dubliners short stories, and it didn't. That I was going through and says, "What's the big deal? It all seems very middle class. It all seems very Victorian angst." And then I got to one short story called Araby, and I think it's still one of the best things I've ever read. It's about a, a, a young boy coming of age, uh, sexually, emotionally, psychologically, and he falls in love with this girl. Uh, his first time he falls in love, and he's quite young. He's like going through puberty, but he falls hopelessly in love with his friend Mangan's sister. And it all culminates in him going to meet her at, at an, an Arabic bazaar, well, uh, you know, a pretend one, at some Freemasonic hall. And when he gets there, she's talking to another boy, and he is obviously heartbroken because he's, he's now learning the lessons of love and I, it's all done under the within the kind of framework of the market being closed down and all these sort of grubby guys who are pretending to be Arab traders taking off their costumes and counting their counting their money and he, he gets his first introduction to how reality is a sham in many ways. It was, it's a rite of passage on an emotional and sort of psychological level. And that story has still to this day caught me. And then the rest of the book was quite interesting. And then, of course, The Dead, which is the final story in it. And I honestly, you know, I actually think I actually, one of the first things I've ever read that actually made me cry as Gabriel is, is you know, recounting the death of Michael, Michael, Michael Fury's corpse under the tombstone, but in uh, in Galway, as the snow was falling across Ireland, and it's still one of the most beautiful passages ever in literature. And from that point on, I said, okay, this guy definitely has something. This guy's definitely got it going. I, I, I get it. I totally get it. Then I read Portrait like, after that, and that was fascinating. And that is, that is a, it is a good one to start out on. And it is a good one because it does bring in the political aspects too, because it's at a point, and you see the similarities with today. It's at that point where Joyce's father has put all his faith in Charles Stuart Parnell. Ireland is on the cusp of a kind of a political awakening, a nationalism without violence, a kind of a middle class revolution that if we vote for the right guy, the democratic system will deliver to us. And it all takes in the context of his mother dying of cancer, his rejecting the church. His development of his own hedonistic lifestyle and his growth as an artist, and that to me was that to me was was just a very symbolic thing because I was I went through that personally myself because I grew up when the troubles, the so-called troubles, were still going on. There was this idealism of the, a political solution would be found. At the same time, I felt incredibly constricted by Irish life, not so much to this, the religious aspect. Or anything like that. Just more that I felt like I was on a wet, damp island and needed to get off. I think there's a line in it where he says Byzantium begins at uh, Holyhead, meaning the port over the sea from Dublin, and in Wales. And that 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 really did it for me. But what really took me to the level was reading Ulysses, and I did read it. I'm not one of these people who who says they they read it and didn't or had a browse through it. I swear I actually read that <laughs> book, and. I, I really do think it is a masterpiece. I absolutely do. I, on so many levels. I love the stream of consciousness style of writing. I love getting in, how he gets inside of the characters. And I do, I, I, I've known guys like Leopold Bloom. I knew, I, I've met those kind of Jewish guys in Dublin. Uh, these kind of like harmless souls that walk around and they're kind of, they're, they're Irish in every single way except they're Jewish. And, you know, you don't get them so much now, but I can remember working with these guys when I was a teenager when I first started working in, in places. And there would be a guy there who, you know, who'd have that kind of Leopold Bloom, like sort of jolly decency about him. It was a kind of unique Dublin Jewish thing that's kind of gone now. And, and Someone then who was kind to enough that, to leave the house uh, uh, at the appropriate time so that his wife could cuckold him? Yes. <laughs> Maybe not. But I do remember he used to cook kidneys. I, 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 honest God, I do remember this guy Victor used to cook kidneys, just used to fry kidneys in the morning, just like uh, Bloom. And then I love the character the way Bloom is comp the, the the whole dynamic of Bloom compensating for the death of his child Rudy and uh, Stephen 
compensating for the loss of his alcoholic father. And the two of them have this kind of epiphany in the back lane behind the house taking a piss. I mean, that is Joyce. And that to me, that to me is why he has an enduring legacy. Well, you're very well put. And you, you bring up, I think, the, the perhaps the operative word that I think so much of Joyce swirls around, which is epiphany. And, uh, and Joyce actually did define epiphany um, in one of his earlier manuscripts that was never published, uh, Stephen, or not published during his lifetime, Stephen Hero, which was kind of the original working version of what became Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, a very, very, very thinly disguised autobiography. And in that, uh, a lot, so much of it centers around art and aesthetics, and part of that is his idea of epiphany, which he defines in that book, uh, where he says, By an epiphany he meant a sudden spiritual manifestation, whether in the vulgarity of speech or of gesture, or in a memorable phrase of the mind itself. He believed that it was for the man of letters to record these epiphanies with extreme care, seeing that they themselves are the most delicate and evanescent of moments. And I think... Really, the, this concept of epiphany is so important to, uh, in Joyce's work, especially, I think, in Dubliners, where it's quite obvious that each story ends with some moment of epiphany for a character, and uh, th that could be extremely powerful. But I think the interesting part of this is that it's through a uh, vulgarity of speech or a gesture, through a memorable phrase, so through something tangible and real, that this character has a spiritual manifestation, reaches some sort of level of understanding that's beyond the physical. But you have to go through the, the real physical reality of the Earth to get there. And I think that says something about Joyce and the way that he viewed the world and the way that he approached his, his art as well, um, which is that there's always there's always a, a real grounded reality to what's happening, even if that reality can can transcend into a spiritual realm. So, I mean, for example, in the Dubliners, where a, a character is fumbling for a corkscrew, but he can't see it because his eyes are watering or, or something of that nature. I mean, it, it's always these mo in these moments that you you understand the the sort of the inner workings of a character's consciousness. And I think that really comes to fruition in, in his later works, especially in Ulysses. But uh, let's backtrack for a moment, because when we're talking about this, the, the sort of going through the physical reality to reach some sort of deeper spiritual truth or con uh, truth about consciousness, let's look back at Portrait of the Artist. You bring up the idea um, that his father was devastated by the, the failure of uh, Charles Stuart Parnell. And it strikes me that for people who did actually take the time to read Portrait of the Artist for this conversation, they, those who are not well familiar or well versed in Irish history probably were lost a little bit in that Christmas um, dinner scene uh, that is the central part of the first chapter of Portrait of the Artist, where his family is basically squabbling over their interpretation of Charles Stuart Parnell and his legacy and whether he was a great man or a vile sinner, um, which is a, a very interesting scene because it's told through um, Joyce slash Daedalus's very young eyes. So he only has a sort of dim understanding of what this is all about, but we get to hear the conversation. For people who don't know, just tell us a little bit briefly about Parnell and sort of his role in Irish uh, politics and history. Well, he was the leader of the parliamentary party. And it was he was the scene as the the way to bring independence to Ireland without the usual methods of war and, and so on. He was seen as a solidifying character to deal with the sectarianism between Presbyterians in the north and Catholics in the south. He was also seen as a kind of a way of bringing both rural Ireland and urban Ireland together towards this independence movement by they and they were very successful winning a lot of seats in the in the in the British Parliament. But it was a ter it was an enormous underestimation by the by the parliamentary party and by the cult of Charles Stuart Parnell. People have a tendency it's really it's it's such the story of today when a new politician comes along, be it Obama or anything like that, he's, Obama's a classic example, any of them, where people put their absolute hope in this will be the guy who will be different than all the others. This is the one that will lead us to salvation. Now, what happened was he had a, it turned out that he was having an affair with a married woman called Kitty O'Shea. And it wasn't anything weird or kinky. It was just a basic romance now, that did not go do, down too well with both 
you know, moralizing Catholics and, and, and religious Protestants. And it destroyed the parliamentary party. And it was, it tore the heart out of middle class Victorian Ireland, who really did, you know, elevate him to an Obama type figure at that time. And it was the it was the end. It was probably also the end of people ever thinking in Ireland that a, an an election could win independence. The nationalist movement really took off. I mean, the, the Republican military movement really took off after that. The scene at the Christmas dinner where his father. Now remember, Joyce idolized his father. Absolutely idolized him, and his father wasn't wasn't a very interesting man too. And when the father has that breakdown and he says my my poor fallen king or something like that uh, that's Joyce really seeing is the, the death of his father right in front of him at a table his father then went on a wild you know went on a downhill basically after that and eventually killed himself with alcoholism and it was that epiphany again here was Joyce realizing that there was no point in playing the game there was no point in being ordinary there was no point in being a decent man like his father because the system was not was not conducive to that, and then in the book, from that point on, it's when he starts experimenting with being an outsider. When he become when he truly becomes an outsider, and that would have been very difficult for him. And the you know he was the golden child who went to the you know the top Jesuit school and everything when he was quite young. He was way ahead of all the other children. He was a remarkable intellect for a child. But yet he had turned away from all that. And it was that moment with his father. And that's actually reflected later on in Ulysses because that the, it's the second last chapter of the book right before Molly Bloom's M Molly Bloom, the Penelope, the Penelope's episode where it, that, that, that amazing dialogue between Bloom and Stephen come, walking through the streets of Dublin after coming back from the, from the, uh, from the the brothel, you're really left with this a sense of healing that this is this is the conversation that James Joyce never had with his father but longed to. Absolutely. Well, you bring up so many important points there, but uh, one of them that comes to my mind is uh, reflected in the fact that full confession, I am holding in my hand my master's thesis from <laughs> Trinity College <laughs> that I wrote over a decade ago now um, on Joyce the Socialisticist. And basically the idea of this uh, thesis was that uh, Joyce at one point had said, had written a letter to his brother um, saying that his political uh, leanings were socialistic in nature, and I was trying to explore what did he mean by that. And the ultimate conclusion of this was not very much, that basically Joyce was not a very politically inclined writer, did not have a very well-defined political stance, and uh, that was a pretty uh, inconclusive way to, uh, to write a master's uh, thesis, but um, well, there you go. That's one of the reasons why I never actually ultimately wanted to become an academic, <laughs> and I'm glad that I didn't. But uh, I think the point of, of that is that really, I mean, politics is such an important background and setting for what Joyce is writing about, but it is not in any way, I think, the driving force of what he's writing, writing about. And that's reflected in things like the, the, the Parnell scene, which, as you say, is kind of the death of his father in his own mind, is the death of the, uh, the sort of political aspirations, um, or at least the political side or nature of what's going on. But something that I think is overriding in every facet of the Stephen Dedalus character, and I'm sure in Joyce's psyche in general, is the idea of the colonization of Ireland. And I don't just mean that in the literal sense of, of England's colonization of Ireland and that history, but in the mental and spiritual colonization of Ireland, the Irish people. And I think this is an overriding theme, an overriding preoccupation um, for Joyce. Uh, as an artist uh, and jo and just the Daedalus as a character and all of this, I guess my I I would love to pick your brain as as an Irishman, growing up obviously in that as you say in that kind of almost Victorian throwback uh, era of your of your youth, um, the the relation between Ireland and its 
colonizers of various sorts, whether that's the Roman Catholic Church or the the, the, the British or whether it's just sort of the outside influence. In, in some ways, I think even the colonization of the, the Irish themselves by the Irish in their own minds. And uh, we see that reflected in Joyce uh, where he, he denigrates the nationalist movement, which you would think would be the kind of natural way of fighting back against that kind of colonization. But he denigrated uh, Yeats's uh, Celtic twilight as the cultic toilette and things of that sort. I mean, he was he was absolutely an iconoclast in every way. I would just like to hear your relation to to Joyce in that sense and the, the, this idea of kind of the the colonization of Ireland mentally and spiritually. I feel exactly the same way as Joyce about that. That that Republican stuff never appealed to me. There's a conversation with imported of the artist where he's, he's having his be- he's having a conversation with his best friend Cranley, and he's slatting Cranley's. Uh, Cranley's, uh, I think he's a Fenian, or he has Fenian tendencies, and uh, Stephen is making fun of Cranley's, uh, you know, Republican nationalism, and that, that's that that's that theme is all throughout it. But I think he was much more well, and also there's the character of the citizen in Ulysses, who's a ferocious bigot and was based on a real. He was a ferocious anti-Semite and was based on a real Republican character. That, that that Joyce knew. I, that's just about everyone in the book is. But I think when you talk about colonis, colonization, I, I think that's ultimately what made me get into him is because he, he expressed perfectly the colonization of the Irish consciousness through Christianity, in particular the Catholicism. And it was ultimately Christianity, uh, this sort of petty-minded Christianity of both Catholics and Protestants, who bought, brought down uh, Charles Stuart Parnell. And in Ulysses, I think the character of Paddy Dignam, when he dies, he's a, he's a hardcore, ferocious Catholic all his life, uh, you know, a total fanatic. And when he dies during the fantasy scene, he ends up going to heaven and finding out that God is a Buddhist. That's another aspect of, of Joyce's work as well. It's incredible. It can be incredibly funny at times in that kind of way. Yeah, so the colonization of the mind is what really he, that's why he was drawn to play he was drawn to Paris because you know Paris at the center of that Fra- France who had long cast off the kind of social shackles of religion probably was the only place in Europe at the time where it was it was cl- it was a clean slate as such spiritually and I find even though Joyce has discarded Christian. Now, when we're talking about someone who was a, you know, a, an educated Jesuit, who, you know, he didn't even kneel down. Him and his brother Stanless did not even kneel down and pray with their own mother when she was dying of cancer. I mean, that was pretty heavy back then, and that's also another element that expressed the truth of the book, the book as well. I think it the opening chapter of uh, of uh, of Ulysses when they're ha- making tea. Buck Mulligan turns around and says, "There's no. He won't drink his tea without milk, but he murders his murders his own mother, and that kind of thing." So it's all about these epiphanies as corrections. I, this is why I find his work very, very spiritual. That's the that's the irony of it. It's incredibly spiritual. Molly Molly Bloom's soliloquy at the end of Ulysses, although it's it's sexually quite explicit, and she's a uh, She's a woman who's having an affair with Blazers Boylan while her husband is out walk, walk, working all day. And even at the end of the night when they get down there, that moment where, where Bloom realizes that he can, he can still love his wife, but it doesn't have to be sexual, but he can still love her for who she is. I think that's actually incredibly spiritual and vice versa. So that to me, if that's the, that's the, that's, that's the, the contradiction in his work is that he he knows that the Irish mind has been polluted by this kind of our, this Christian conservatism on both Catholics and Protestants, particularly creating a petty minded mentality. But he's not an atheist. He's not looking. To, that's why I, I retitled that. You know. That, that that video after I re-edited it and, and, and chopped it down because I thought that a lot of it was kind of silly but I got the best bits out of it and that's why I called him a literary magician because his use of language and his use of phrase it, it almost reads sometimes like you're reading religious text in, in the way the, 
explain the way the syntax is laid out, especially if you read those books out loud, especially Ulysses. He goes through heaven, he goes to hell, he goes to heaven and all these things. But he does not discount the spiritual experience. And I find that amazing because if if he was truly trendy, let's say, just say if he was truly sort of like a fashionable, you know, intellectual intelligentsia of the bohemian sect, he would reject all religion and all spirituality. But it's very much the opposite. There is an embrace there, isn't there? That is, I mean, as you say, tinged with irony and contradiction, which I think imbues everything that he does. And perhaps one of the biggest ironies, of course, being that he had to go, he had to go abroad in order to find home in many key respects. And of course, never, never was able to to really return to Ireland, and uh, never was able to reconcile with his home or his erstwhile home. What is what is the ultimate message of that? I mean, is the iconoclast is there a home for the iconoclast, or are they destined to wander the earth, always just longing for or trying to reconstruct home in their own minds? I think that's exactly it. What you just said, he was uh, the iconoclast and the exile exiled artist ultimately begins to in their mind begins to build, and this is all this is Joyce in a nutshell an idealized geography of the place they left from in that they, they, they start to see it almost like a dream and they, then it becomes a dream like experience of the past. I mean, it's, there's no, it's absolutely true. And people said if the city was ever destroyed, they could rebuild it from scratch, scratch, just using his, his books as the, uh, the as the plan, the architectural plan to rebuild it. And that's, that's again a healing kind of thing. It's almost like a religion. You see, we're back to the idea of the the sort of like the the default undercurrent of spirituality again. Ulysses, although it's written in Paris, is his pilgrimage to Dublin, in the sense that he knows there's there was there's tremendous there's a tremendous font of creative and artistic and a very deep well of artistic and social and cultural, you know, realities he was able to draw upon. But that layer of petty-minded Christianity and Catholicism in particular is almost like the poison in that well. And so he can go to somewhere like Paris and he can, he can, he can, he can draw from the well without having to draw from the poison within it. And so that's a classic... Uh, that's that's really what the iconoclast is. The iconoclast is like the the person who falls madly in love with someone. The the love affair ends badly, and they hate them. They hate the other person, but they don't really hate them. They hate the fact that they can't love them anymore. And that, to me, is Joyce's relationship with Dublin. So do you feel that the, the end of Portrait of the Artist, April 26th, Mother is putting my new secondhand clothes in order. She prays now. She says that I may learn in my own life and away from home and friends what the heart is and what it feels. Amen. So be it. Welcome, O oh life. I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. April 27th, old father, old artificer, stand me now and ever in good stead. Is that hopeful is that is that something that we should be celebrating or is that the break that we should be in some sense lamenting that ireland couldn't find a place for someone like joyce the uncreated conscience of my race i thought that was still is still most one of the most remarkable things ever written but that experience this experience is not just unique to ireland i mean it's you know if you look at the the writings of british writers in the in the 60s like osborne look back in anger that that experience also existed within britain and as i'm sure it's existed in everywhere else from the united states to canada to you name it there's always been writers who've been dissatisfied with the where they live in ireland because of the small the island remember we're an island we're a small island it the idea of leaving is not that strange to us but the the idea of the uncreated conscience of my race he was literally. They see. There's an egotism there. There's another. As an this is the, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, <laughs> big time. You know, like he's he's setting himself up. Well, let's be honest about it. He kind of achieved it in many ways. The Ireland of today. You know, we just recently are, were the only country in the world who voted in 
you know, same sex marriage through a national vote. And that's, you know, that's about as liberal as it gets anywhere. So in many ways, this is the, the Magnus aspect. This is the, the this, he achieved that because that those ideas, and I'm a firm believer in this idea that if you create a work of art, you're actually creating a work of magic. Now, when I say magic, I'm talking about intention into action and then changing society from something that originated in your own consciousness. This could be Joyce again and his Jesuitical background. It's the, the whole Jesuit education is very much on altering consciousness. And so he, he did it. We can laugh all we want, but he did it. And it's it's an ongoing process. I, I mean, his 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 love letters to Nora are so, are so pornographic that even today they're they're shocking. They're absolutely shocking by even today's standards. And so it's a, that they're not even there's so much of Joyce's work like the pornographic stuff that's still not even talked about. And that was just him pushing the barriers. It was almost like he was being a druid or something that he was. Using his own, you know, his existence alone, his actual biological, physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual existence was to rebuild reality around him. And you don't often see that in your own lifetime, but he most certainly did in reality. I mean, the, the, a lot of the a lot of the things he longed for that that didn't that weren't delivered in, in Dublin back then have been since and. It's 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 ironically it was the intellectual intelligentsia of Bohemian artistic classes here, getting into positions of power after say the 1960s that helped deliver that along with and this is the biggest irony of all. The Gaelic revival thing also came to fruition around the same period, and it was almost like that had to happen first. And although he poo pooed. Yates and all that, Yates's whole you know idea of this, but Yates's reality has come true as well in a different way, and that to me is why I called him the Magus from Monto. Monto was the red light district in Dublin. He, you know, and that's 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 the the part in Night Town in Ulysses, the the epiphany, the powerful sort of like shamanic epiphany happens there, where Stephen sees his mother that probably drinking absinthe or something like that Stephen has an has the hallucination of his mother's corpse rotting with cancer in the lampshade and smashes it in the chandelier and smashes it to pieces with a broom when they get outside bloom falls down on his knees and has a a a vision a hallucinogenic a hallucination of seeing his baby rudy almost like as a the, the boy jesus Floating in an alleyway, in a, in a you know a urine stained alleyway, behind a brothel. I mean, this is this is this is phenomenal stuff when you start even just that section when you start looking at it. And this is this so. Yes, he ran away. Yes, he was an iconoclast. Yes, there was tremendous narcissism in the final passage that you just read there in Portrait of the Artist. But guess what? It came to pass. And I suppose the lesson, if we want to make it into a pet lesson, is that to manifest our consciousness in the world can have the types of effects that we couldn't even really dream that they would have, that we can actually make a difference in this world by manifesting ourselves in it in a, in a, a, with conscious intention, as opposed to, say, um, being like Stephen Dedalus's slash James Joyce's father and p pinning our hopes on some nebulous outside political force that we can actually change the world by manifesting ourselves in it. Well, look what you and I have done by just saying enough of this bullshit. You know, we were, <laughs> look at the people we've reached and we're not the only ones. There's dozens like us have done this. And that's the same thing. That's intention, consciousness into intention and produce it and then producing the action. And then it gets out there and we, are you and I not iconoclasts? Are you and you and I not the same as, as young Stephen getting on the boat at Dunleary to sail to Hollyhead? We we had that moment too, the crossing of the sea. When he when when Joyce is describing Stephen crossing the Irish Sea, he's describing the death of the old Stephen. It's almost like a River Styx experience because you know his, his work is laced with their uh, Hellenic archetypes. Across the sea. So the old one dies and the new one begins. When people like you and I 
decide to go out there, and this is also very hopeful for people listening who don't know what we're talking about and go, what these 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 two gobshites on about? <laughs> to, to use a Joycean kind of language, <laughs> uh, what we're saying to you is that Joyce proved that being an iconoclast against the prevailing orthodoxy can allow you to make changes in reality that are far more spectacular than you even in your wildest dreams thought would happen. You've done it, I've done it, and lots of others have done it. So there's the message there that you can also do that. And so there is, this is why I love the iconoclast. I love the, and the recycling of that because there is a lot of hope in that because it, it works, it works. And this is why art is so much, I mean, this is why you're, I love your show is the fact that you cover things like lit, this kind of literature and, and, and interesting, important films. You cover Kafka's and all this kind of thing. It, this is to drive home the point that it's very easy for someone to get political. See, this is what makes alternative media so much better. It's very easy for someone to get just politically interested or politically angry. But if you do not have a kind of a, 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 a cultural, and I mean that in the broadest sense, buffer, not buffer, a uh, undercarriage support system below that, to guide you through it, it seems as a very bleak, a very bleak journey at times. But this is the beauty of literature. This is the beauty of art, painting, poetry, music, is that it acts as a support mechanism for this journey. So I would say to everyone, look, it's not negative. It's very positive. I, uh, don't be don't be intimidated by James Joyce. And even if you never read one of the stories or know anything, or even get anything we talk about, the ultimate message is that being an iconoclast and taking that boat across the sea for the old you that was well, let's be honest, the old you of us was generally killed by this realization that the system was so corrupt and was so poisonous. I mean, is there any difference between how you and I as, relate to globalism? Than, than when Joyce related to Irish nationalism or Catholicism when he was back in the Victorian times. There's no difference. It's just the, the narrative is the same. The contextual aspect has changed. That's all. I think, yes, I think that's an important way of, of maybe putting a bow on this conversation because, the yes, the point of the, the colonization of the mind and the colonization of our spirit and consciousness is the fact that it is going on today, no matter where you are in this world. It's it's the, the outside forces of of the psychopaths and, and the others uh, who puppeteer this system who are trying to colonize your mind. And it's the question of how you relate to that. And Joyce is one example of how someone negotiated his own way in life with that. And of course, it doesn't mean you have to literally follow his biographical example, although it strikes me for the first time that maybe I am sort of a uh, alt-media Joyce. I'm, I'm forging in the, the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of well, not c Canadians, I'm not sure. But hey, I, I did cross the ocean, and I am now an exile from Canada, I suppose. Interesting. Well, um, I, there's so much to, to talk about. I mean, we couldn't possibly encapsulate it all in a conversation like this, but I think we've left with uh, people with some various things to chew on. But before we wrap up this conversation, and since I'll probably never have or won't have much opportunity to talk about Joyce on the program in the future, I suppose we should at least touch on the idea of Finnegan's Wake. I'm not sure if you've actually read the, uh, the, the intimidating tome, even more intimidating than Ulysses. I myself, I know I tried to read it once. I'm not sure if I actually got cover to cover, but I don't think that reading cover to cover is necessarily the point of a book like Finnegan's Wake. But I will uh, just direct people to a couple of resources that on uh, looking at Finnegan's Wake that I think is interesting. One is uh, from disinfo.com, which I think is an un unfortunately entitled website. But anyway, they have a post uh, from just last June, James Joyce, Modern Psychonaut, with uh, various people talking about Finnegan's Wake and their relation to it, including Alistair Crowley, speaking of magic. I am convinced personally that Mr. Joyce is a genius all the world will have to recognize. Or uh, Timothy Leary, Joyce's prose prepared me to enter psychedelic space. Uh, Terence McKenna, Finnegan's Wake is about as close to LSD on the page as you can get, and uh, other such quotations like that from people who are interestingly connected into intelligence psyops, so make of that what you will. I will also point people to uh, Jean-Baptiste Vico, who wrote, uh, who's a 17th century, 18th century Italian rhetorician who wrote Scienza Nuova, New Science, which is um, referenced um, quite a bit in Finnegan's Wake, and 
he basically had this idea that there were three ages of society, the, uh, the, the age of gods, the age of heroes, and the age of humans. And basically, uh, he had some interesting things to say about the way that uh, um, all nations begin in the same way by the power of the imagination to make the world intelligible in terms of gods. This age of gods gives way to a second age in which Fantasia is used to form social institutions and types of characters or virtues in terms of heroes. And finally, these two ages in which the world is ordered throughout through the power of Fantasia decline into an age of rationality in which the world is ordered in purely conceptual and logical terms and in which mental acting is finally dominated by what Vigo calls a barbarism of reflection. And long story short, uh, Joyce incorporates this cycle, cyclical history idea from Vico into Finnegan's Wake. So you have all these cycles and, and circular things going on in Finnegan's Wake, including, of course, the last sentence running into the first sentence. So it's all it's all one big cycle that you can go through in, indefinitely. And uh, that also relates to a fascinating theory called the Strauss-Howe generational theory, uh, better known as the fourth turning, saying that at least in American politics, there's an identifiable four-generation cycle, um, which uh, follows a, a certain pattern of uh, a high, an awakening, an unraveling, and a crisis. And in every crisis generation, there's some sort of cataclysmic event like the Revolutionary War or the Civil War or the Great Depression. And lo and behold, here we are living right in the middle of what Strauss and Howe has predicted as the fourth turning of this generation. So some sort of crisis in American history once again, which I think is an interesting sort of tie in to sort of the Finnegan Wake cyclical history idea. So much you could possibly say about this work. Anything, anything that strikes you about Finnegan's Wake, this this monumental tome of what most people would probably consider to be complete gibberish. You have to be kind of Irish to understand what's going on because he throws in various phrases. What I find, you know, relating to places in Irish mythology, that you would want, you'd really want to know about it to live here. I sorry, live here to grow up with it to know about it. I will say this though. I never read Finnegan's Lake, I think, more than a couple of pages at a time. But I think that's what it is. I think what Joyce was trying to do at Finnegan's Wake was to rewire the consciousness of the reader, almost like as a reset button. Like, I'm glad you said that you don't start at the beginning and go to the end. It's not not that kind of novel. It's uh, it's the ultimate bathroom toilet book. You pick it up, you read a couple of pages, or even before you go to sleep at night, you don't necessarily have to understand it, but I think it's almost like he was trying to rewire people's neural pathways or scramble them, almost like, yeah, scramble them, that'd be a better word, in order to get them out of conditioning and to have them rethinking again. It also sounds pretty fantastic if it's read aloud by the yes. right person. Right, you, yes. You know, it can almost come across. And there is a recording of Joyce reading Finnegan's Wake or, or a passage therefrom. So I'll put that in the show notes so people can listen to Joyce himself actually reading a passage. And I agree. It is poetry. It's almost music in a way. It's absolutely beautiful. And I would make a case for this book as a children's book, if nothing else. I think children would delight in the in the sound of the language. I think it's just beautifully written in that sense, um, even if it is pretty incomprehensible from any sort of rational sense. Yes, if you just listen to the, to- the tones, it's also got an interesting rhythm to it. Uh, was that, that I've heard that recording of Joyce reading it, and it's very rhythmic. It reminds me a lot of the most ancient form of Irish music, which is called Shano singing. This goes back, you know, thousands of years, and there's a lot of that energy about it. Again, it it's not meant to be taken on the conscious level, but it's really it's a treat for the subconscious. All right. Well, Thomas Sheridan, I mean, it's such a fascinating topic for me personally, at any rate, the idea of freeing your mind, which is something that the alt media often talks about. What does that actually mean? And does Joyce provide some sort of at least a literary example of what that can actually mean in our, in our art, in our consciousness, in our own lives? And I think the answer, well, I mean, it's going to depend on different people. And I'm interested to hear what uh, Corbett Report members have to say on this. So, of course, you can log into the website and leave your uh, comments on this conversation and uh, join the conversation. Uh, do you think this is important? Do you think this is just uh, literary wankery, <laughs> which I'm sure, uh, well, uh, Joyceans have been accused of since time began. So there you go. Quite I mean, rightly, quite rightly. <laughs> yes, I agree. I think there is a certain pretentiousness to at least the, uh, 
the, the way that certain people adopt the the literary pose when it comes to Joyce. But uh, but there is there is so much of value in there as well that uh, we definitely do not want to throw that baby out with the bathwater. But let's not take it too seriously. Let's not take ourselves too seriously and risk becoming one of those literary uh, pretentious goons from Trinity that you talk about, like myself, I guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, was gen- it was generally the Irish ones. Can I just say before we close, yes. if people want to start on James Joyce a very, and don't want to tackle a book to begin with, watch the 1960s movie version of Ulysses with Milo O'Shea. It's it's a good introduction to how Joyce thinks, and it's a very good film adaptation if you can consider what, what the director was dealing with. And then go to probably... The short story set Dubliners, if you want to go and read it. Right, yes. Uh, yes. Well, certainly Dubliners would be the place to dip your toe in the literary uh, works. And I have never seen that 1960s uh, uh, movie of Ulysses, so I will definitely check that out. I'm interested to see how on earth you could turn that into any sort of recognizable film uh, narrative. But uh, but interesting stuff. All right, well, Thomas, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about art and consciousness, so we should, of course, introduce people to you, the fact that you yourself, of course, are an artist. You have your own art. Tell people a little, little bit about that and how they, can, uh, how they can see it. Well, if they just go to the website, there's a gallery there, thomasherdenarts.com, and you can check that out. And that's basically it. I don't get much time to paint these days. I spend, I've been spending a lot more time under the ground and <laughs> megalithic tombs and passage graves. I'm making a documentary that's going to come out in a couple of years. Well, I'm one of the, the hosts of it, and so that to me is where uh, I mean, I ha- I'm I'm in, I'm I'm in there now. I'm actually I'm become this like subterranean creature, but looking at scribblings on the scratchings on that were left by people thousands of years ago on rock walls, but I'm loving every minute of it. But that's the, that's the, again, that's the, the idea. I just want to strip down my own consciousness down to a base level and begin again, because I think, you know, art is the best way of, and Joyce proved this, of hitting the reset button in your consciousness. Hmm. Yes. Well, art as a healing tool as well, such an important idea and concept. Um, again, so much to talk about. ThomasSheridanArts.com is the place to go to find um, all of that and all of your writing and your, your radio show and all of that. So I hope people will check it out. It will, of course, be linked up in the show notes. Thomas Sheridan, thank you so much for a very, very interesting conversation. Likewise, James. Thank you. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.